Hello everybody, it's Jamie and welcome back to a new series called Let's Read a Book. In uh, On this series we're gonna cover some books together. Um, I don't know how long these videos will be, but um, we will find out together. Uh, so yeah, grab a cup of coffee, of tea or whatever you like and I hope you enjoy the video. So the first big book we're going to cover is uh, The War on Hospital Ships from 1914 till 1918, written by uh, the lovely Stephen McRill. I hope I said your name, uh, your name right, sir. So uh, I'm gonna leave a link in the description uh, to a website where you can buy the book for yourself. So uh, yeah, and again, enjoy the video. One more uh, small thing before we start with reading is my English pronunciation or pro pronunciation is uh, it sucks but I <laughs> I hope you will still understand at least a little bit and uh, again enjoy it so uh, yeah let's start with the first chapter it's called 19 or it's in 1914 and it's called uh, those in peril on the sea the former passenger liner rolled on a lazy swell as she steamed through the chilly February night High above the brightly illuminated hospital ship, a myriad of stars twinkled from distant constellations, their, magnif their magnificence ignored by the ship's watchkeeper, whose rasping cough shattered the air of the serendipity. He stumbled his cold feet on the bridge wing deck in an effort to restore some circulation. In 10 minutes time, his watch ended and he could head off for a welcome hot mug of sugary tea. In the meantime, he remained on vigil, scanning the sea surface for the telltale wake pronounced or produced by a submarine periscope. It was a nerve-wracking business, for each white horse took on the appearance of the briefest of wakes. The odds on him noticing a, protr a protruding periscope in a vast expanse of the sea before him were slim. Nonetheless, he knew the western emboldened with a sign of the International Red Cross had, in accordance with the Genoa Convention, immunity from attack. With her accommodation, 300 wounded servicemen, many of, them, many of whom were confined to bed, felt reassured by the Red Cross, cross flag fluttering from the vessel's mast, in a mistaken belief that they were free from attack. Their faults were contrary to the nearby submerged U-boat, whose commander, frustrated by the lack of any kills on this almost completed patrol, watched through his periscope the, the passing hospital ship. He briefly wrestled with his convenience, conscience I mean, sorry, knowing all too well the consequences of a torpedo strike on any ship. Never mind to one conveying wounded. As a German naval chief insisted, the British carried munitions on such vessels. He reassured he was justified in making an attack. He, got a, he called out a course which would position his craft at the right angles to the hospital ship. Torpedoes were loaded and their range set. His first torpedo struck the liner amidships, simultaneously to the explosion the ship lightly, lightly fated minutes later. The first lifeboats laden with people, mostly wounded, were lowered into the sea, to be gradually joined by the others. The bow of the mortally wounded steamer settled deeper into the sea, raising her stern up above the sea's surface and displaying her now slowly revolving bronze propellers. She lay there, if frozen in time, before an almighty internal rumble imitated and she plunged to the seabed. Apart from wreckage and a cluster of lifeboats, she, no visible sign of the hospital ship remained. The war at sea reached a new level of barbarity, where Germany would attempt to succeed and almost manage to drive the Red Cross from the high seas. In 1859, a Swiss merchant named Henry Dunant witnessed the aftermath of a long and bloody battle, fought among the hills around the Italian village of Soleferino. The French forces lost 17,000 men, against Austrian losses 
of 20,000, 22,000 men. Thousands of wounded soldiers lay helpless and abandoned throughout the hills, waiting to succumb to their wounds. Moved by the tragic experience, Dunant suggested the establishment of a volunteer unit, skilled in a it administrating basic medical aid to the casualties of war. To provide the skilled staff, he recommended they be trained in peacetime, in preparation for deployments in times of war. At unofficial 1863 International Conference, Henry Dunant orchestrated an agreement between nations. Consequently, each country agreed to form a humanitarian relief to assist their army medical corps during the conflicts. This agreement became the foundation stone of Red Cross. A year later, the Swiss government convene, convened a diplomatic conference where a dozen European countries became sig signat signatories to the Genoa Convention for the Amel Lortration of the condition of the wounded in the field. It was the first treaty of international humanitarian law. The agreement ensured in future wars that the sick and wounded soldiers of any nationality were to be treated by belly, belly regents and non combatants and, afford, and afforded medical attention. Any hospitals, medical personnel, or ambulances displaying a red cross upon a white background were to be treated as neutrals. The first international conference of the Red Cross occurred in 1867. The Hague Conventions of 1899 amended the agreement to incorporate the laws and customs of war and land. A third convention added prisoners of war and the inclusion of maritime warfare to the articles first raised in 1846, Genoa, Genoa Convention. On 6 July 1906, the General Convention revis revised the Convention of 29 July 9 1899 with a further 28 articles having a particular em emphasis on hospital ships. The first five of these are not are the most significant are the most significant sorry article one Mili military hospital ships that is to say ships constructed or fitted out by stage especially and solely with a view to assisting the wounded sick and shipwrecked the names of which have been com communicated to the belly to the belly belly regent powers and the commitment of hostilities and in any case before they are employed shall be respected and cannot be captured while hostilities last. These ships, moreover, are not the same footing ships, are not are on the same footing as ships of war and regards the stay in a neutral port. Article 2. Hospital ships equipped wholly or in part at the expense of private individuals or officially requested relief societies shall likewise be respected and expect and exempt from capture. If the belly regent power to holy they belong has given has given them official commission and has notified their names to the adverse power at the commitment of during hostilities hostilities and in any case before they are employed. These ships must be provided with a certificate from the compent authorities, the claim that the ships have been under their control with fitting out and on final departure. Article 3. Hospital ships are equipped wholly or partly at the expense of private individuals or officially requ requested societies of neutral countries shall be respected and exempt from capture on condition they are placed under the control of one of the belly regents, with the consent of their own, with the consent of their own government, and with the of authority of the belly regent himself, and that the latter has notified their name to his adversary at the commen commencement of or during hostilities, 
and in any case before they are employed. Article 4. These ships are, these ships are mentioned in Articles 1, 2 and 3 shall afford relief and assistance to the wounded, sick sh and shipwrecked of the belly regents without distinction of nationality. These governments undertake not to use these ships for any military purpose. These ships must not in any way hamper the movement of combatants. During and after an engagement, they will act at their own movements of combatants. Oh, sorry. They, they will act on their own risk and peril. <laughs> sorry for that. The belly regents shall have the right to control and search them. They can refuse their assistance, order them off, make them, make them take a certain course and put a commissioner on board. And they can even detain them if the gravity of the circumstances requires it. As far as possible, the belly regents shall enter into the log of the hospital ships, the orders which, are, which they give them. Article 5. Military hospital ships shall be distinguished by being painted white outside with an horizontal band of green about a meter and a half in breadth. In breadth. Breadth. I mean, in white, I mean. The, ship, the ships mentioned in Articles 2 and 3 shall be distinguished by being painted white outside with an horizontal band of red about a meter and a half in length again or in wide these boats of the hospital ships and also small craft which may be used for the hospital work shall be distinguished by a similar painting all hospital ships shall make themselves known by hoisting with their national flag the white flag with a red cross issued by the geneva convention and further if they belong to a neutral state by flying at the main mast the national flag of the belly regent under whose control they are placed nothing within the convention entitled at a belly range to sink an opponent's uh, an opponent's hospital ship the first real test of the genoa convention arose during the 1904 russo japanese war both parties had ratified the convention and mainly adhered to their agreements or listened However, the Russians alleged the Japanese deliberately fired, and Russian fired at a Russian hospital ship during May 1904, siege of Port Arthur. The Japanese denied such allegations. In June of the following year, Japan seized the Russian hospital ship Kostramas and Mongolia, which they later released. A third hospital ship, the Orel, allegedly carried able-bodied able-bodied prisoners of war and military equipment. A Japanese prize, co prize court condemned the use of LRL for signaling and providing other than non-medical service to the Russian fleet in ways that amounted to the use of military purposes. As a result of the Russo-Japanese war, the Genoa Convention gathered in October 1907 to add numerous amendments to all previous to all previous agreements. Two of the additions have particular relevance to this account of maritime disasters. Article 1. It is forbidden to lay anchored automatic contact mines, except when constructed as to become harmless on our, one hour at most, after the person who laid them ceases to control them. Also, to lay anchored automatic contact mines which do not become harmless as soon as they have broken from their moorings. Belly wrench should not use torpedoes which do not become harmless when they miss their mark. Article 2. It is forbidden to lay automatic contact mines off the coast and ports of the enemy with the, role, with the sole object of intercepting commercial shipping. The Geneva Convention essentially is a recommended listing of those of those and do not to ensure fair play between foes in times of war, 
but a great deal depended on how an enemy intercepted a particular section of the code of conduct. Events later proved some sections allowed sufficient leeway for unscrupulous manipulation, manipulation of the various sections. It would appear nobody considered a large deployment of a hospital ship in any future wars, as the only convict Convict appears to be the as in incident. Incident. These ships, these ships must not in any way harbor the movements of combatants by sailing into the line of fire. The article alludes to the hospital ship's traditional role of remaining on the fridges of the fleet during a naval engagement. For centuries, hospital ships had accompanied fleets in battle. And some academics believe the ancient Greek and Roman fleets contained hospital ships. They base their assumption on the knowledge that the Greek Ephesian fleet contained the Teropia, Therapy, while the Roman fleet included Asculpius, named after the ancient god of medicine. His symbols, his symbol, and Asculpis. A road bearing an intertwined snake now represent the symbol of physicians throughout the globe and is also the central motive in the Royal Army Medical Corps. Cap badge. The 16th century Spanish Armada, Spanish Armada fleet is considered to have contained 15 hospital ships. The first recorded British hospital ship Goodwill joined the Mediterranean fleet in 1620. Her medical complete, her complement considered well, consisted of one surgeon, a surgeon's mate and three attendants. In 1805, the Admiralty implanted a suggestion that every warship should have its own six-berth compartment. These were normally positioned in a forward position capable of benefiting from the wharf generated by the ship's galley. As the years passed, numerous vessels served briefly as hospital ships and store ships, but their numbers were neglectable from 1793 to 1845. The Navy list contained 29 names of vessels used as hospital ships. On the average, they served for a period of seven years each. As naval battles were fought in coastal waters, it was relevant, easy to return the sick or wounded to Britain. Shore-based hospitals had a dreadful reputation and treatment on the hospital ships may have been only marginally better. Two hospital ships were permanently at Plymouth, three at Portsmouth, one in the Thames near the Tower and another anchored at Cork. The hospital ships, which, we, which accompanied the fleet during the naval actions, took up station beyond the range of gunfire. Immediately after the engagement ceased, the ship ventured into Floatsam and Jetsam to rescue the maimed and dying. During 1841, Chinese Opium War, Chinese Opium War HMS Minden, served as the hospital ship for the British fleet. Throughout the Crimean War of 1853, hospital transport ships sailed for Crimea loaded with stores. On the return leg to Britain, they carried approximately 100 sick and wounded servicemen. By 1833, six birth attendants appeared in ships, master papers as a recognized category of naval, of naval rating. In 1873, Mount Flung, a war, fought on the African Cold Coast, produced a high level of sick and deceased troops. Partially among the naval content, the HMS Victor Emmanuel and the HMS Simon acted as a base hospital ship for the Shakur, for the Shakur of the sick and wounded patients during the campaign. In time, the wooden World sailing ships gradually disappeared and sail gave way to steam. Their, their revolutionary dreadnought class of warships 
ushered in a new area of naval firepower. But the vessel still required maining, and the crews and the crew still succumbed to illness or sustained injury in battle. And that was the end of the first video. I um, I hope you understood it a little bit. Uh, again, as you can hear, I'm not um, good at my English uh, pronunciation. But I hope you at least understood a little bit of what I said. Because uh, the story of the hospital ships needs to be covered. But that's my in my opinion. So... Um, let me know in the comments if you think I should do uh, a part two of uh, this book. Um, thank you for listening. Again, I'm sorry if I sounded, if some words came out the wrong way. But um, have a good day or a night, everyone. And see you on our next voyage. Goodbye, everyone.